Welcome back to the Romo Unpopular Opinions. You've seen the title. You know what's coming up. <laughs> I am doing my best not to let this fall, but it is time for a complete reread of Noragami. I will give you all the details that I need in a minute as soon as I put this down. Now, I reread Noragami once. The first time that I read it, it was, I think, kind of quick, as it always is with the first read, because you're trying to figure out what's going on. The first time that I reread it, I didn't have all the volumes, so I think I started here with volume seven. But now that I've got the beginning and everything, I think we could do like a comprehensive video. Does anyone care is always the question that one should ask oneself before doing long reading vlogs. I never ask that question because I treat these as diaries of a kind. Like I do it for stuff that I enjoy. I did it for Attack on Titan. I did it for Winter Night, although it needs to be finished. I did it for the Grisha trilogy, though it needs to be finished. And I did it for Star Wars, though it needs to be finished. I love making them. Obviously, it's never my goal to really make them two hours long, and I will do my best to keep it under an hour. That being said, to cut down on the rambling, spoiler filled, because that's the only fun way to do these. So, like, if you're not caught up with the manga, if you plan to read the manga, <laughs> don't watch it, obviously, because it will be referencing everything till the latest chapter, which I think was 104 or 105. I, I want to say 104. So yes, spoiler filled, if you don't care about the manga at all, maybe you can just hang out anyway and see if you're interested, but I obviously won't be detailing the plot, I'll just make small comments assuming that you know what's going on, but this will be very fun and let's see if I can actually keep it under an hour. These are the stray stories by the way, I just have no clue when to read this. Like obviously it's not really the first thing you should read because it makes no sense no sense out of context but ah uh, in the show they kind of like did the ovas i think that were in this and that was kind of it so i'll be reading this at a random point in the video does anyone else really really love like these omnibus editions they started releasing them for noragami i think last year i pre-ordered both of them. <laughs> Obviously, I would like to have the entire series in Omnibus Edition, but that's just a waste of money because I ha I collected the entire series before I knew the these would be coming out, but then I saw it just in the nick of time and managed not to buy the first six volumes so I could do these. But like, just how it looks and like how thick it is, is so aesthetically pleasing to me. Like, look at Look at the wonder of this and it has like the bendy spine so you can actually read it properly <laughs> this is how you should do all manga and i know this is kind of becoming more popular now with attack on titan and stuff but if i knew about these obviously i would have waited but i started collecting noragami like two years ago or a year and a half ago so <laughs> it wasn't that realistic that i would be able to wait for these but I love these editions I love them just as a warning though I when I bought these I kind of read them like I didn't read them properly because I didn't continue on with the rest I just kind of flipped through them and read the stuff that felt like it wasn't in the show which I will comment on by the way because I just like doing that comparison I did that with Attack on Titan too because there's a lot of stuff in anime that when the adaptation isn't like meant to be an adaptation but rather a commercial for the manga like in this case they change a lot so they don't actually have to go into the main story they add some stuff and they change some stuff so they can make an anime that's like good enough without having to continue it it's a weird thing <laughs> that they do for some animes unfortunately that they do for this because this is actually would be a visual masterpiece if they kept animating it but yeah so i will actually let you know how different it is and if i remember correctly from flipping through this one there's actually quite a bit of a difference in season one
You know a story is not to be taken seriously when you're introduced to the main character <laughs> as stealing the school's toilet paper. What? It's all single ply. I'll, I have a sensitive ass. I'll have you know <laughs> public property is my property. Like, <laughs> Yato is the definition of he's a goddamn menace, but you grow to love him despite it. <laughs> Like, how Hiyori became in love with him, honestly, I commend her. Because it seems like it took her a bit less time than it would take me, but... But yeah. <laughs> He's a goddamn menace, and this is his introduction. Literally his introduction. The entire beginning is a lot different than the show. It's also, like, Yato stopping bullying, but this one's a bit more, like, in person, I guess. You meet... Yato and Tomone, I think a lot sooner than you meet Hiyori. Like in the show, you see Hiyori pretty quickly. A lot of the stuff, obviously, that's how animes are made. That M Mutsuri, Mutsuki, what is her name? I, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Sometimes they're so similar, it's insane. I want to say Mutsuri. Mutsu. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the stuff that happens with her, they just, like, put on Hiyori. Like, how Yato gets upset when someone tells the Shinki that they want to die, and some of the dialogue was just, like, passed over to Hiyori, but here we are. Best girl has been introduced. Like, actually a decent chunk ib. <laughs> Her first drawing is, like, so, so pretty. I'm not sure where, like, the first volume ends. I'm not sure if there's a... There's an obvious break. I think... I think this is it. Yeah. I think this is it. So. This is halfway through the first volume, and... He already just showed up, so... That's the, the only difference so far. Just some of the dialogue and the entire character was transferred to Hiyori, but I think the rest is kind of going to be the same. I know there's one major difference, though. The whole thing with... The other god of calamity, not not in the manga at all. There's like a couple random chapters that haven't been published except online. That's like, oh, clash ye gods of calamity. That has that character, but I'm not sure if that was done after the show or if that was like a random chapter that uh, that Chitoka made and then they put it in the, in the show. Because I love that whole finale. I think that actually might be my favorite bit in the anime when Yata fights and the shrine and the rain and everything like it's just very well done the ending of season one so when I was reading the manga I was like am I am I missing something because he, he doesn't even exist that character in the main manga and I was genuinely so confused so that's a very very big difference like in case you were wondering so was I but after I finished volume one I was like okay Volume 2, I know, will be about the whole Bishamon drama, so there's no way that it's gonna, like, come after that. <laughs> Apparently they just either adapted it or came up with it for the show. The flawless transition of, besides, there aren't any boys I like. Like, it's just, It's not even subtle. <laughs> like, it's the next page. I don't want it to be subtle, though, because this was the slowest burn that has ever burned. Like, we've barely got the confessions 25 chapters in, and they haven't seen each other in ages, so. This, this, is, this, is, this is suffering, if you can even call it a romance. But, like, that's besides the point. <laughs> I just love how Hiyori was like, I'm 15, I don't like any boys. A god will do <laughs> Talk about high standards. She she was she was the girly for high standards in her her own story. Like we have to respect it. Obviously, this isn't like massive foreshadowing. I'm sure they thought out Yukine's backstory like in the beginning, but this is still volume one when Yato falls to the floor and is crying when he binds Yukine. And as of now, I I'm not sure when we like uncovered his entire backstory. I think. The entire truth of it was like volume 24 or 25. I mean, the cover of 25 is upsetting. <laughs> so it, this is like volume one. And only in volume 25, we like learned the true entire story of why Yato cried when he cried when he, I'm 
converting you to Balkan. Why he cried when he binds Yukine. And I just love that attention to detail. I love it so much. This is a story that's so simple and yet so enjoy enjoyable. Like, I think its strength is that it doesn't take itself seriously, but it still manages to pack in emotional relationships and friendship, romantic feelings, platonic feelings, partnerships. Like, it has so much while also being very simple. So, like, if someone asked me, is it the best thing? thing ever like an epic saga no it isn't but also it's not even trying to be which I think is definitely its greatest asset like you are going to have a lot of fun with this like you can relax knowing that you're not going to be having like panic attacks every five chapters but you're also going to get emotional heart-wrenching moments which is I think the best balance like that you're not trying to be epic but you still kind of manage it in a little way because you're not trying there's something i would love if someone could clarify on every website like on mall on goodreads on every single website it says that damn it it says that ada chitoka is like a duo of writer and author apparently not from the beginning beginning because like there's a whole long part after volume one where one person keeps saying that i used to be just the artist now i have to write the whole story myself so did she whichever one of them was the original one like hire but the name was made from two names like the pseudonym was made from two names so i'm very confused like is it two people from the beginning did one of them like hire a backup artist later because it's obviously one person is doing main plot and main drawings but when did when, when does the other woman come in <laughs> That's, that sounds funny when I say it like that well, the other author like is she just a background artist was she there from the beginning or wasn't she because like the whole thing where she's like now I have to draw and write makes it sound like it's just her doing it but i know it's two of them except in none of the like author comments have ever mentioned there being two of them but on every website it says it's a combination of the names of two authors so i have questions i'm getting a little tired so i'm thinking that like this this will be it for today but also one thing that's different, like when the little girl is killed, killed again, Yato, there, there, there's no scene where like Yato has to kill her and Yukini is upset because they had to kill her. They just added that. Like she just disappears and they leave and find Yato like back home or whatever. And then like it continues with Yukini going home with here so it's like why did they add that little specific detail with the kid i think because it was like a commercial for the manga that arachitoka worked on the anime a lot and she added stuff that would like still get you interested but kind of work in the alt universe of the show hello it is in fact a new day i have finished Point one, I just wanted to highlight this because it's genuinely such a nice moment. Because he's like, just find that one irreplaceable someone. And then later he says, I wish I had one myself. <laughs> you do. You do, bestie. You're going to get a platonic and a romantic. You're one ir irreplaceable self. So lucky you, actually. I finished Omnibus 1, which is the first three volumes. Nothing new. <laughs> Nothing. I just wanted to highlight how good of a character Hiyori actually is. I keep saying it, but I feel like I need to <laughs> say it again right after I read this. Usually for main characters, they have to be OP and like powerful badasses for them to be badasses. But she is one while actually being the weakest character here. 
like power wise ability wise she's the weakest character here like she's a little bit better than when she's human in her ayakashi form but she's essentially very weak and can't do anything against any of these gods but she keeps saving them she keeps finding yato like with her thinking she comes up with ideas she thinks of something he would think of without asking him like she just works so well as a main character who isn't op like she's there as support but they also like wouldn't be alive without her <laughs> a couple times in this series they genuinely wouldn't be alive without her and she didn't have to like literally kick ass to be able to do so and i love that so much because Arashi Toka managed to find a balance between not one character has to be like an OP and a genius for this series to work. There isn't any characters, I think, actually, in this series who are very overpowered and also geniuses. I don't think she has a genius character. They all have their flaws and they all have an area that someone else can help them in. And I love and appreciate that so much like Hiyori is an icon but she doesn't kick ass Yato can definitely kick ass but he isn't exactly a genius he needs a lot of help from other people then you have other characters later like Take and Bishamon and everyone else and Ebisu who also definitely a lot rely a lot on the help of others and I love it I love it it's such a weirdly low stakes story that actually manages to like subvert anime manga tropes very very successfully now moving on to this what i do remember because this one i actually read i think most recently i flipped through it when i bought it and that was back in like november or even december so i remember this one the most i will flip through it anyway but i think the most of it is the Bishamon storyline. Now the differences with the show are getting kind of extreme because after that night of like the new year, Nora makes Hiyori forget them and then at the end of the season she remembers them when when the whole <laughs> thing with the other god of calamity happens. Now since none of that is in the manga, that means that Hiyori doesn't forget. I think she never really fully forgets them, but she forgets them because she hasn't seen them in a while later. That's when Yata's dad takes her on that date, which I think will be either here or like in volume seven. That means she never actually unnaturally forgets them. She just forgets them when they've been gone for a long while. And I guess that was a story thread that they kind of wanted in the show to interest you but i'm still very confused as to why none of it is actually in the manga i actually loved that story thread when she forgets about them and in the last fight when she remembers just as her and yata are like under the rocks it's a great scene and none of it is in the manga so that's a big difference for you but i think what was it what was it called second season Aragoto I think this is the entirety of the second season and I think they didn't change it that much except for dialing down on the dad because they obviously <laughs> couldn't put him in the first two seasons considering that they never intended to adapt the rest of it <laughs> from now on protect your master for your namesake I will I stake my name Yuki on it it aged very poorly. If you've read volumes 20 onwards, it aged very poorly. Now, I think it's time for me to say what I was going to say all along in this vlog. I have grown to really, really dislike Yokine. Now, I get he's a teenager and I appreciate all he's been through. And when they put him in the box later, when there was the whole trial of the gods, I felt for him. But see, his arc is non-existent. Like, he basically just degenerates again and again. Like, <laughs> the latest story with Yukine is him doing this exact same thing all over again. Like, forsaking Yato, going bad, and them having to bring him back. Like, I get it was because he found out the god's secret, so, like, the circumstances are a little different. It wasn't completely his fault. 
but it's frustrating to watch a character for 25 volumes kind of behave the exact same way as they did a hundred chapters ago like we already went through this with Yukine I don't care about him that much to have to see him do the same exact thing over and over again like he I hate to say it because again I understand the story's reasons for it but he doesn't deserve Yata's kindness if he keeps doing this thing over and over again so when they do bring him back later I'm not even sure if I'll be that relieved because <laughs> If you have a Shinky that unstable, I'm not sure if it's a great idea. And I feel mean for saying this because I know it's not his fault, but just from a story perspective, as soon as he switches to Kazuma, an actually like mature, strong Shinky who finds out the God's secret and is like, I don't care and doesn't succumb, it's just such a relief. To have someone like that finally be with Yato instead of having to deal with this little annoying teenager. So I guess <laughs> those are my two cents on the whole story. And I, in the latest chapter, I mean, Kazuma is back with Bishamon. So I'm not sure if like <laughs> him and Yato are done as a partnership. But I was just so relieved when he got the new Shinki because, because Yukina is just the same character in all of in all of the story. Another difference is that they did the OVA for season one before season two or around the same time, which is a little bit confusing because at the beginning of volume, or rather the end of volume four, they go and visit the tree where Suzuha will die. But in the OVA, they're picnicking there to honor him and he hadn't yet died because definitely not all of season two was released so they did a bit of a mess messy job with the anime but again depressingly that's how you can recognize that they don't plan on adapting it they're just doing it as a commercial and it's honestly a shame it's really a shame because this could have made a really good manga especially with the latest couple of volumes like the fights are getting epic and you just know that Yato's dad, <laughs> Yato's dad would be having so many, so many fans. And it would be embarrassing, but it, it would be very funny to watch. <laughs> it's only volume five. And Kazuma has noticed, <laughs> has noticed Yato and Hiyori. Like, I, we love him. I mean, he can relate. But the fact that she, like, shows up, they start arguing. And Kazuma is like, I see She's why he won't leave. Like, it took him all of five seconds to see them arguing and be like, ah, there it is. <laughs> I get it now. Kazuma and Bishamon might actually, like, be my number two pairing in here. But they're a little bit more precious than the other two because they've been together for so long that I don't think it's ever going to actually be romantic. They just have such a deep, deep bond. I mean, they shared... Two families together and he turned into a blessed vessel for, blessed vessel for her and it's just a little bit a little bit different apparently i can't speak <laughs> when, when i'm reading talking in my own language and then having to talk in english so yeah welcome to being bilingual they did animate this but yatha turning absolutely murderous as soon as he realizes that they targeted hiyori is maybe my favorite shot of all time like, he just looks so blank as he's listening to her parents. But as he walks away... Feral. Absolutely feral. That is what we like to see. I love the development of Daikoku just, like, adopting them. <laughs> That's when they come back from Takamagahara. He's like, I will not have low lives for children. And as soon as they come back, he starts crying when he hugs them. Such a simple found family, literally such a simple found family, but family is one of the big themes actually here. The one thing that I'm missing, and I realize that I'm missing it every time I go back to the beginning, <laughs> is Takemi Kazuchi and Kion because I love them more than I think anyone in this fandom can comprehend. I don't even really have a reason why, because they're also kind of both a mess. 
But as soon as Taka and Kiyun actually became main characters, like appearing all the time alongside Ebisu and like Tenjin and the others, I am just so much more happy because they are comedic geniuses. <laughs> they are comedic geniuses without even trying. Like how Kiyun is so lazy and just wants to sleep. And Take is kind of a hothead, but actually very powerful. So he has like a justification for being a hothead. I love them so much and I miss them. And this is going to be, I think, volume, the end of volume six that I'm almost at, which means I have like <laughs> 10 more chapters until they actually become 10 more volumes until, until they actually become proper characters, which is a little upsetting. <laughs> I don't <laughs> you could have added this because it adds like such charm to the story but when Kazuma and Hiri were trapped they were playing Shiritori take the end which is Kaladont in my language I have no idea what it is in English <laughs> no idea what it is in English but the fact that they were passing the time playing the game is actually so so weirdly funny because you can see that even like they're trapped and in danger and they're just playing a random game to pass the time. I love that so much. These like translation notes at the end can actually be very fun to read, especially if you don't know Japanese just like I don't. So it's kind of interesting to see what they chose. And very often the translators will like say <laughs> whether this was clever is open to interpretation. And I actually do quite love that. I will now be finishing <laughs> Blue Exorcist because I have two episodes left and then we will move to another position spot i think spot is better in this context and read more i was thinking that before going on with the main series i would pick this up now i'm genuinely still not sure where it's supposed to go like according to the release date this was released in 2013 and i checked the omnibus volume that was like 2012 2013 so i guess it would like come up now I'm going to check volume 7. <clears throat> volume seven, 7 is also 2013, so hell if I know when I'm supposed to read the stray stories, but I think I'm going to pick them up next just to get them out of the way. They're just very fun, random, random stories. Some of them they didn't do over, some of them they didn't, but cheers. I will see you after I finish the anime. We have uncovered, <laughs> this is absolutely on the wrong side, uncovered the secret of when this takes place because in the second story, Kugaha is still there and he's banished in volume six. So you should read this between volumes like five and eight, I would say, wherever you like. But since Kuga is still here, I don't know, then maybe before six i'll read the rest because i know obviously this wasn't written at the same time these are short stories but the first two stories i would say read before volume six so i'm gonna see if the rest of it has any spoilers if not that is where you should read it okay uh the last story i think yeah the last story is after he already made him the shrine which i'm, I'm trying to <laughs> Which I think is definitely like past volume 10 because I remember that Yato is still stuck in... No, wait. Yato gets stuck in Izanami's underworld. But when does she make in the shrine? Before they go. So like one, one of these, either volume 7 or 8, because I think in 9 he's already... Yeah, in 9 he's already in the underworld. So... Between volume six, you can read all the stories except the last one, which is before volume nine, but after seven and eight or between seven and eight. It doesn't really matter because like the only mention of the actual plot is the fact that she made him the shrine, but this is just like a, like an info 
info point for you if you really want to be accurate then don't read this until in the manga she gives him the shrine the fact that yato the menace is a neat freak he wears a hand towel <laughs> the thing is a hand towel <laughs> like he's a clean freak he can embroider he can draw he made all of yukina's clothes himself He's a menace, but like a tidy one when he wants to be. It's just such a funny detail to me, I guess. These are like the early drawings. You get that in the back of this, and I actually find it quite cool. Yeah, it keeps saying that this is a series, but I've never seen the rest of it, like either translated or online. I saw like a copy somewhere in Japanese, but apparently no one ever bothered to translate it, so <sighs> no part two. I wish there was actually more with the later characters, because if I got like such a gag sh collection of short stories with Take and Kiyun, I, I would absolutely ascend. It's just proof they didn't want to adapt it because this entire volume is the OVAs. I, funnily enough, I think the picnic, as I said before, was done for season one, which which was a weird choice. But not many people have even seen the OVAs, so it was even stupider. But the picnic and him possessing her in school were all in this, which is just regular volume seven. So I'm not sure why they even did the OVAs if they weren't going to do the whole story because it's like a little bit odd like they released the o over with Bishamon even though it's after season two I mean it's just classed as Ova's for season one I think it was all released around the same time but still it's a little weird and then the whole thing where he possesses her is actually not just a funny gag it's because she's been ignoring him at this point because he became obsessed with her as soon as you, she said she doesn't want her guys ties cut from him he's obsessed with her and he won't leave her alone so it's <laughs> it kind of had like a double meaning why he actually possessed her and wouldn't physically live leave her alone so it's, it's just a weird weird choice that they made with the anime but we're done with the anime now we're just up to the manga so i mean obviously not the part with izanami and stuff is also the anime but that bit is pointless if you don't factor in the father which the show really didn't want to do so they just mentioned him once or twice but yeah we're going into the manga properly now and I can't wait I can't wait because it's actually genuinely so good I read it twice now and I always feel like there's details that I keep forgetting because it has so many actual like cultural Japanese characters so it's easier to forget some of them <laughs> for me I understand it isn't in a romantic context here, it's just like the relationship between gods and their followers, but Yato would become a raging spirit for you if he had to. I never have that kind of power. You already do. As a matter of fact, he was very close to doing just that in this most recent disaster. And Yukine, his shinki, did nothing to stop him. Why? Because your life was in danger, Hiyori. Even if, if, even if it meant plunging the heavens into chaos, even if it meant killing a god, rescuing you was their highest priority. <sighs> that's all I have to say <laughs> that's all I have to say I just will always be a sucker for that kind of talk <laughs> you know but when when Daikoku and Yukine are beating their masters it just said no this is not domestic violence it's part of a Shinki's job <laughs> Yukine is beating Yato with slippers he is feeding him with slippers. I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but he is feeding him with slippers. This is so not a serious manga. I understand that's absolutely not everyone's cup of tea, but if you want something that's just like pure fun, that makes you love the characters and occasionally have actually hard-hitting battles, <laughs> then pick it up because it's so good. You want to know what's actually genuinely irritating about the fact that Kodansha are the only ones publishing English manga? All of them are printed like right to the edge 
of possibility. So for a lot of the dialogue, I have to be like, <laughs> like I'm either gonna rip this thing apart or I'm gonna, this is where it was especially bad. Like look, look at this, look at where the text goes up to. Like you have to rip it to see the end of it and be like, okay, yeah, I, I hate this. Like they could have just printed it with margins. I don't know, but like, the omnibuses don't have this problem because they're on large, flexible paper. But this, it's only flexible if you rip it. Like, at, at some points, I think the text, like, goes right into there. Because, like, for example, here's, there's, like, a little footnote that says shrine yato, explaining, like, what the number on the shrine means. I think the O, like, goes right into the binding it's 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 the worst it's genuinely the worst this is obviously a bit of an interruption <laughs> so hang on give, give me a second there we go now one thing that i found funny in takamagahara is that all of the ones who are like talking or rather the one is Take and I've not seen Take yet this is like just me knowing that it's him but I miss him so much I miss him so much already I'm, I'm sorry for this I miss him so much but it's a lot different than the show where he already properly forgot about them here when Yata is gone here it's been a month and she still hasn't forgotten she will just be a bit cloudy about it when she goes on the date but she will remember immediately in the show it was done a bit more dramatically and twice like twice they made a very very dramatic amnesia plot line which is just a very very odd choice like she never in the manga forgets completely she will just come very very close when she goes on the date and <laughs> kisses his dad I mean, he kisses her, but just the thought is not great. <laughs> there, it all passed now. She kind of forgot when she was in Capypar land, but she didn't really forget because every five minutes she was like, there's someone I'm forgetting. So genuinely, she never once in this series actually forgets, unlike the show. I think half of the show's two seasons was basically Hiri having amnesia, which is just so weirdly funny to me like immediately after Yata's dad kisses her there's a sequence where she meets Yukine in the street and she's like I'm sorry that I forgot you so don't let the anime lie to you <laughs> our girl would never forget them that easily this is reverse main character syndrome I got conceited I thought that I was different from everyone else that I would never forget but I'm not an exception <laughs> Hiyori once again proving that she's my favorite in all of like anime manga and possibly like in the Hall of Fame in general, one of my favorite female main characters ever, even though she's not overpowered, even though she's absolutely weaker than everyone in this show, even though she's like a teenage girl, I love her so much because her agency, her kindness, but still being a sarcastic badass at times and her whole thing where she's like I got very conceited I thought I wouldn't forget but I obviously did like immediately admitting that it's <laughs> that she's not special in this regard and immediately she's not like one of those like I'll go into danger anyway anytime they're in danger and she's like I can't handle this one she lets Yato and Yukine handle it I just love her so much she mastered as a character being humble and not being boring at the same time like I love her It's literally two right now. I only have one or two volumes till they leave Izanami's underworld. But <laughs> my child, my love, they are here. <laughs> Obviously not in name, but he's finally summoned Kiyun. That's the only glimpse I get of them in the show. <laughs> but I love how they are definitely hilariously overpowered. <laughs> like... <laughs> They say it themselves that Arahabaki's Shinki and Takemikazu's Shinki are strong without even being blessed vessels. So imagine if they became blessed vessels. I'm so happy she chose someone like Take to actually become a main character. Like he could have been this random antagonist, but his fight with Yato 
and the fact that he then becomes like their reluctant friend and actually a main character I love so much it was a random addition to the cast but I love it I love it so much because it came so naturally like he fought with Yato but then you actually learn his backstory and you get to know him and Kiyun and it's the story is just so much better for it I am apparently just in my phase of really really loving them but don't get me wrong I would still die for the mains but Taka and Kiyun are just such a overpowered but such fun dynamic the fact that this moment right here like this cut right here is what gives Kiyun the iconic like thing over his nose we've never seen Kiyun yet but like right here in volume 9 he gets the most remarkable thing about him like I mean not remarkable but his distinguishing feature and it's just so iconic this is I'm gonna try and keep this under an hour I promise if you're still here congratulations you must be a fan also one major difference from the show Ebisu dies immediately after coming out of the underworld like he explodes in Bishamon's arms I know in the show they kind of wanted the emotional moment to see that he and Yato bonded none of that here he blows up as soon as he comes out <laughs> there is still the fight with Kiyun but he blows up right after that and I think I'm not sure if it was his Shinki or just a little girl that blew up but anyway a lot of blowing up of people <laughs> in this volume but yeah he dies in Bishamon's arms and now she's gonna go save Yato which is the last volume I will be reading today volume 10 and we read the stray stories that's all of 11 volumes that i read in the last 26 hours <laughs> so we are doing very well i'm gonna have to start studying tomorrow so it's probably gonna be a bit longer than two days but up to volume 10 let's go i think with this it wraps up the anime and then volume 11 is the ova where they go to copy from land um Amaterasu, what are you doing in here? I straight up forgot that she appears so early on. Like, what is she doing here? I, what is she doing here? I, I forgot, but what? She's gonna help them get Yato out of the underworld? Okay, I do not remember this. One extra difference. All the threads that have something to do with father or the or the heavens they didn't touch on in the anime I mean they kind of teased the father but they didn't touch on them in the anime because they had no intention of doing it so the fact that she says she came because she wanted to come not because like the heavens told her to she whispers to Ebisu probably that like if you call their true names they can come back but like why why would she involve herself in that way I don't think she properly shows up until until the fight with like heavens versus Bishamon versus the father although I do think she kind of shows up after Take because of the whole trial on Yato and Yukine but I genuinely forgot that she shows up here and helps him I think I blocked it out because I always watch the anime and I kind of block out the two pages that she appears in but Amaterasu shows up in volume 10 in case you didn't know The fact that my genius girl literally believes so much in the reaction he gave when she gave him the shrine. Like, she believes he was so, so touched that the name couldn't be wrong. Like, he could have just been touched because he was given a shrine. But she's like, he wouldn't be touched if I just gave him a fake name. Because she realizes that if you just move the line a little... It is another name like my queen the fact that Yato was so worried because he told none of them his real name and she logicked it out chef's kiss look at how happy he is to see them he kept saying I want to go home to them I think found family is the one thing that gets me going like there doesn't even have to be romance involved but found family Shh, top tier top tier of the tropes genuinely i'm practically done now 
like I'm reading the atrocious manga, but I think my favorite like random bit of side character development is how Daikoku really grew to treat them as his kids. Like this, this exact panel where he's like, we finally get some peace and quiet now that they're gone. And then she's like, why did you make enough food for five? <laughs> but he loves them so much. He literally treats them like his kids. He will have no hesitation to step up when they will be in danger, even though he might die later in the trial for, for the fight. But I just love little things like that. We are done with volume 10. And I think this is where the manga catches up with the show. So if you, you were wondering... The show is basically volumes 1 through 10, and then the OVAs are some stories from Stray Stories and the story from volume 11. Then it's manga only. Not the finest angle, but my phone is charging. I am up to like this point in volume 11. The thing that's heartbreaking about volume 11, like Yata finally got her to confide in him. Because he's like, you can tell me everything, come on, I want to help you. And then she feels so bad when she's like brusque with him and everything. But the fact that he wants to cheer her up by taking her to the one place where he thinks no one can feel unhappy, like the entertainment land and everything, is the one place because <laughs> that is causing her unhappiness. Like he even collected this is probably the first time he's actually spending money on another human being like he wants to cheer her up he wants her to confide in him and he brings her to the one place that is actually traumatizing for her so when she's hurt when he brings her there she is so hurt that he thinks she just doesn't want to spend time with him and thus we get the most intimate scene i think we've ever had with the two of them which is ironic but it just makes me so sad how happy he is when he gets her the tickets. Like, he is so excited and he's like, you've been down. I'm going to take you somewhere really great. We're going to go have fun. <laughs> and it's going to be the one place where she doesn't want to go. Again, the thing that makes it so sad is that he's a little forceful. But because he really, really, really likes the people that he likes, like, he's like, why don't you want to see it? Is, is it me? I want to watch it with you. It's sad to watch it. It's social suicide. And then when she says you don't have a social life, <laughs> he already just hurled a scath scathing, scathing insult. <laughs> like, there's humor even in the serious moments, but the fact that she's literally like, just let me go, and he insists, and she still goes with him, but as soon as he sees that he made her cry, he'll be like, I always mess it up. I always make it about myself. This was supposed to be about you, but you're the one who's crying. And like, <laughs> this entire scene is just so, so sweet. Because everything he's doing would be seen as very, very sweet if that wasn't like <laughs> the most traumatizing thing that she went through and the one place where she actually forgot about them. So, like, she isn't crying because of him, but he thinks she's crying because of him. This is, like, just the best. <laughs> Why do I keep having fun when you're miserable? When I'm with you, I just feel so free. I can't help myself. I'm hopeless. See, I never do vlogs where there's a romance in whatever I'm reading. <laughs> so this might be, like, a first. Now that I think of it, you were never that excited about this. I'm sorry. Like this. These two, okay? These two. Like the. <sighs> he always managed to say exactly what I want to hear. But the fact that he constantly is scared that she is going to forget it and him. <sighs> See, the thing is, and it's time for me to actually like talk this through, which I haven't mentioned yet. The way things are standing, I have no idea how they can be together ever in this story because if they're together while she's human in a couple of years she's going to look older than him which is going to be weird <laughs> but if she dies 
and he makes her his shinky. She's not going to remember her life and everything that they went through. So, like, I do not see a happy ending for them. And I'm really, really curious how the hell Ada Chidoka handled that because, because I don't see a way that they can stay together without it being either awkward or she forgets everything. The fact that Yukine took this picture. Like, Yukine took this picture. In the show, it was Ebisu. But Yukine took this picture. He is already treating them like his adoptive parents. I just know it. I'm at the whole bit where he <laughs> sprints sprints to her house because he found out that like his dad kissed her but Hyuri is having none of it she's like you're one to talk Yuki's Mishima then they just keep arguing and he obviously apologizes as he usually does like he just first he behaves like a menace and then he apologizes why am I always ca causing problems is it possible I'm a disaster spreader too he finally realized I don't want, I don't know what you're apologizing for, Yato, but please stop blaming yourself. Heroics like that aren't really her style. Like, they adore each other, but she roasts him so hard. She's always like, stop embarrassing yourself. <laughs> I love them. I love them so much. I love how they handled the problem quite, like, painlessly. She was like, but you did it too. Did not. Did too. Okay, fine. Yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. Nothing to apologize for. You're just a mess. <laughs> I love them. Your Honor, I love them so much. And there's so much pain and suffering. This is about halfway through, actually. Like, this is volume 12. There's 25 currently out. 26, like, in, <laughs> in circulation. Okay, so not completely halfway, but, like, one more volume and we're halfway through. So this was actually very quick. Is this vlog long? probably so i'm gonna cut down on the rambling but there's so so many like little things that i just want to mention they probably mean nothing to anyone but me but if i'm gonna be honest these are like personal diaries for myself and i look back on them sometimes to see my thoughts and it's such a fun way to document document some of your favorite series i guess i am talking a bit less but i suppose that's a good thing for the video we are done with volume 12. This one is always a little bit painful to read because it's about Sakura and how she was destroyed by the god secret, but it's such a good volume. Like, it's genuinely such a good volume. I'm not sure what happens next. I think soon they're going to go to Takamagahara for the meeting and everything, which means that I'm getting to Take and Kiyun. <laughs> I don't want to read for too long because it's already, like, 1 30 but i really want to get to take and keen and i'm not sure when they first show up unfortunately i think in the battle and that's going to be like volume 17 or something but i'm going to try and read a couple more volumes and if it's the matchmaking ceremony or something then i think take should kind of show up so i will let you know but on to volume 13 i remembered this volume is about he already losing it and him saving her life it's like every volume has something delightful to look forward to but what i find funny every time is as soon as she told him that like his dad is threatening her like this is her in class i would hardly be able to pay attention to an algebraic equation i have two dudes like stuck to my desk but I think they're growing up to Takamagahara now, so I really can't wait. And then she goes insane after the whole hospital thing happens. And I think that's it for volume 13. Volume 13 was actually the last one that I bought that wasn't a pre-order. So I like always kind of have a special memory tied to this one. But it's just so good. <laughs> it's genuinely so good. Like it's such nuanced fun that it's a delight to read last time i kind of read it quickly because i wanted to get the reread over with this time i'm taking it slow and i'm taking my time i'm trying to take in the story they both have such childish but compatible ways of dealing with affection when they can't handle it <laughs> like he just turns into a absolute menace 
and he annoys the crap out of her when he likes her and she as soon as she like gets close to something resembling actual emotion she just beats the crap out of him <laughs> but again it's compatible because she can handle him being annoying and he keeps telling her to walk all over him so when she beats his ass it works <laughs> I'm just trying to cover up the fact that I'm about to be very sad because I hate the thing when she almost dies but he barely saves her. The way Yata says this really reminds me of Astraeus <laughs> and anything that reminds me of Astraeus I am on board with but when she's telling him about her future and why she wants to be a doctor why she might not, might not know she wants to be a doctor she just keeps laughing and he's like, I never thought you'd actually ask me for advice about your future. Does it annoy you? No, I love it. It's, she's just so happy she's actually talking to him. Don't all of us want that? Just someone who's so, so happy to talk to us and to listen to us and to be given the chance to give us advice. Like, that's all. That's all any of us want. To varying degrees, obviously, that's not enough, but it's kind of the basis. You knew I would talk about this. The one sign of someone's true love affection, whichever it is, could be a platonic relationship, is if they want what's best for you, even if it doesn't align with what they want. Like in this moment, Hiyori, in her crazy state, is like begging to be with him. She wants to be with him. Dad, obviously, because he's teasing, like is like, I'll give you the word, make her a shanky, kill her, and she can be with you forever. Practically everything is telling him to do that, but he's putting her first. Like, he's not putting his wishes first. He didn't even consider it. He's like, absolutely not. You're going to live a full life. You're going to be a grandmother. Like, I'm not going to end your life just because I want to spend it with you. And I think this is like when it became clear to me how strongly he actually loves and respects her as a person because practically everything was laid out to him on a platter she wants to be with him dad is telling him make her a shinky yukine just wants this over with and he's like absolutely not like i will not allow this to happen you will not be dying you better be a grandmother <laughs> And that's just so sweet and so precious. This is actually like halfway through the series. And I think this solidified their relationship. That's not even that romantic here. They're just teasing every now and then. But such a strong bond overall of like respect and absolutely not putting your wants over that other person's. I'll just read it because it's so good. I can't let you come to this side yet, not not until you grow up in an, into an old lady. You'll be okay. You can try again as many times as it takes. You have loved ones waiting for you. Go back to them. Like in this, Into this equation, he doesn't even want to bring the fact that he is one of her loved ones. He's just like, you're young, you're alive, and they need you, and you need them, and you better not join me here until you're dead. Which again, I'm not sure how she can join him even when she's dead. Because even as his Shinky, she wouldn't remember her life. But let's not get into it. <laughs> let's say that they break the God's Promise thing by the end of the series. Because all the Shinky have been finding out the God's Secret in the last couple volumes. But still, like, that's a bit odd. We'll see. I have no idea what Adachitaka would do with them. I genuinely have no clue. So I'm going to be surprised either way. The fact that he... His first repeat customer is Hiyori's brother. He's so funny to me. Like, the world is really small. I guess that's true. I was going to stop, but this is the matchmaker volume, and Take and Cute show up here. I'm going to read this, this one, hopefully finish it by three, and then do something else, because I can't read anymore. I'm very tired. Like, five volumes today. Like, it's not going as slowly as I wanted it to go but as soon as I saw Takemi Kazuchi I was like I'm he is here there is no light you cannot see him he is here I knew it was one of one of the two of them but he is here we've got one end of the pair I can't wait to see the other 
And here we have part two of the puzzle. I don't think I'm going to comment on anything else because it's really getting late now. But they are, they are here. My boys are here.